How are we doing this week? All right, everyone hanging in there? Good, nice to see you. <laughs> it's lovely to be uh, back at the Humanities Festival after a few years, and um, especially an honor, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, give a talk prime time on the last day of the festival this year at the Art Institute of Chicago, the greatest museum in the world. Right? Uh, How's that for playing to the crowd, right? <laughs> so uh, now that we're all together, um, you know, this, uh, this theme this year of speed is a real challenge for an architect because architecture, long story short, is very slow. It's slow in practice, it's slow in thought, it's slow in theory. Um, it's usually intended to last, not to go away, and it's usually discussed in terms of the past or present tense. Um, so today I'm going to talk about architecture and this kind of problematic relationship to time. Millions of pilgrims immediately descended upon the city of Chicago when Oprah Winfrey left this earth on her 120th birthday. These hordes of global disciples knew her simply as the Oprah and the institutional complex that she left behind became a holy city. She had sold the Oprah Winfrey Network in 2015 and returned to Chicago because California's financial collapse had made the growth of her new media empire in Los Angeles seem increasingly unlikely. As fate would have it, the simultaneous financial crisis in Illinois provided the opening she needed to re-establish her good works in Chicago. Mayor Rahm Emanuel's Infrastructure Development Trust was a solution to the state and federal budget cuts that had left Chicago's roads and transit systems crumbling. Sensing an opportunity, Miss Winfrey proposed that, in exchange for an unprecedented capital investment, she would receive development rights to certain sites in the central area. Former Mayor Daley and Mayor Emanuel served as her brokers with the Illinois legislature and Obama administration. By the time the deal was done, Miss Winfrey had acquired perpetual leases on air rights over Interstate 290, the Circle Interchange, and the Kennedy Expressway. No one could have anticipated the great developments that followed. By the time Oprah Media, commonly known as OM, became fully operational in ten short years, Miss Winfrey's expanding wealth had driven her notorious generosity to even greater heights. In 2020, she offered to pay off the mortgage debt of any property owners in the central area if they relinquished all rights to any future sales. Not surprisingly, most of the wealthy declined but the vast majority of middle-class business and homeowners willingly accepted, since their property values had not increased for 15 years. She also built new housing blocks for the poor. Impeccable management and family development programs ensured that most people only lived there for a few years, thus eliminating any comparisons to the public housing that had once plagued Chicago. And by accepting these gifts, the poor and middle classes all effectively became Miss Winfrey's subjects. The people had neither willingness nor ability to separate their fates from hers. The ruined and corrupted public education system came next. Her scholarship endowment of the University of Illinois at Chicago made college nearly free to all citizens of the state for the foreseeable future. UIC was renamed the Chicago Free University. Miss Winfrey also built what by all measures was the world's largest charter school. She provided a place for every child living within the city. She guaranteed widespread total equality of education. Every family, rich and poor, sent their children since her school surpassed even the best private institutions, both in terms of resources and student achievement. Her triumphs over the worst and most chronic urban problems earned Miss Winfrey the nickname Mother of Us All. Her investments had a dramatic effect 
on the urban economy in just a few years. The number of skilled employees began to multiply exponentially, as Chicago Free University expanded its enrollment, and people from around the world were attracted to the prosperity and culture of wellness that she created. Miss Winfrey's empire grew as her followers grew, and the central area became her company town. The architect, Daniel Burnham, dreamed of the White City, and his dream was finally realized upon the foundations of Miss Winfrey's stewardship. After her hostile takeover of Google in 2025, the Ohm Library over the Circle Interchange became the undisputed center of global knowledge and communication. This archive, and its sister institutions, renewed Chicago as a center of enlightenment and spirituality on the level of Vatican City or Mecca. And thus, it was. The Oprah ascended from icon to guru to prophet by building a radiant city of inescapable benevolence, boundless wealth, relentless beauty, and transcendent power. Should we just break for lunch now? <laughs> um, so as you can start to see, time has become a medium itself in my work. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today are uh, three ideas and three recent projects that show other relationships of architecture to time, the sempiternal, the, sempiternal, the immediate, and the eventual. This word sempiternal is, is not very commonly used. It can be used as a synonym for the, the word eternal. But in philosophy, it actually refers to things that are not actually eternal because, of course, uh, eternity is reserved for the, is an abstraction, it's reserved for the, the spiritual realm. But uh, on Earth here, it can refer to things that seem eternal or everlasting. So things like cathedrals or museums. Uh, or art or, or other things. So, for example, um, here we have an image of the great ziggurat of Ur in Mesopotamia. It's just outside of Baghdad. It's both a temple and a monument, a step pyramid, seemingly eternal. But nothing, of course, lasts forever. This is what it looked like before it was restored uh, near the beginning of the 20th century. So architecture is both a witness to time, but it also is a kind of victim to the passage of time. Um, this is a small but I think uh, intensive, let's say, investigation into some of those questions. Um, it's a project that I call the Ziggurat, and it was a temporary installation at the Arts Club of Chicago in the garden this summer. It's a garden folly. What is a garden folly, some of you may ask. Well, architectural follies, there's a tradition of these small um, constructions that goes back at least to 18th century gardening in Europe, France, uh, and England. Um, most notably revived more recently for the Parc de la Villette by the architect Bernard Schumi in Paris, which you see on the right. They're pleasure pavilions. Uh, they typically don't have a function and they're often kind of half-built, resembling either ruins or an architecture still under construction. So this is another view of this 10-foot tall structure clad in uh, an aluminum foam, which I'll talk about in a moment. And in the tradition of Garden Follies, it has no program, nor is it physically occupiable except for mentally. The, let's say, source material for the project was a small collage from a longer series, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. In this collage, you see works of architecture, or fragments of works of architecture, going from left to right by the architect Peter Eisenman from New York. Um, in the center, uh, architect Frank Gehry, who we all know very well here in Chicago, and then on the right, uh, the recently late Zaha Hadid. And so, first of all, when you go from two dimensions to three dimensions, you have to deal with real problems of 
translation, right? To go from something flat to something three-dimensional, the rest of the construction, the rest of the architecture basically has to be somehow invented. So here you can see images of different sides of the early models. But then there's also the problem of scale, how big it should be in relationship to the body, for example, or in relationship to the site. So something which started without a site, without a location, suddenly finds itself in a particular place with particular uh, conditions. So situated between a building, a fence, and two trees. And then there's the question of translation to construction itself. So similar to the collage or to collage making, the seams in the construction are actually used to unify uh, the volumes and surfaces by running around the corners. So what you start to get is this illusion of stacked stone blocks, even though it's metal, thus hearkening back again to the notion of a different kind of architecture, something more archaic, something apparently sempiternal. And then there are also, for me, I think um, it's interesting to talk about certain fundamental criteria which uh, put the project, let's say, more on the side of architecture than, let's say, sculpture. A consideration of how it meets the ground. So on the left, you see this sort of uh, strange aluminum I-beam, which of course in Chicago has other meanings or references to the architecture of Mies van der Rohe or modernism in general. So an attention to how architecture meets the ground, how it meets the sky. So on the right, you can see um, what I sometimes refer to as a, either a chimney or what I call the holiest of holies, this strange void in the top of the structure which is only visually accessible from above. And then, of course, architecture has fenestration as well. That's what architects call windows um, and doors, openings. So, uh, and then finally, architectonics is the art of joining. So as I mentioned earlier, the material is stabilized aluminum foam. It's a fairly new, advanced material. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's molten aluminum that's had air injected into it and then solidified. And the little video you see on the right is a digitally controlled water jet cutter over at Elston Metal Tanks here in Chicago. So that gives you a sense of the process of how the, the ziggurat is actually, actually built. So basically what you're seeing is a, is a very high speed and high pressure jet of water mixed with uh, certain aggregates that can actually cut things like metal or stone or glass. So what you have in the end in the ziggurat, I think, is a, is a small building that appears monumental and a temporary installation that evokes the eternal. So coming from another direction, there's this question of the immediate. As I was saying earlier, architecture tends to be slow. Becoming an architect is a very slow process. No one lets you do anything until you're like 60, uh, you know, so. Um, in, in other parts of my work, I've been trying to make work that is both immediate in its making, but also immediate in, in how it can be engaged by, by different audiences. So this is an image of my studio floor, a uh, photo by the photographer Michelle Litvin. So you can see kind of what happens. I work a lot with collage, if you haven't noticed already. And simultaneous with the ziggurat this summer, I had a gallery show here in Chicago called Chimera uh, at Western Exhibitions here in the, in the West Loop. It was basically a self-imposed exercise in isolating, uh, isolating and testing what I sometimes call a stealth collage. So every image is actually cut and pasted by hand, um, and it's a production of a kind of instant architecture. So for me, these are rapid, individuated and also serial acts of world making. I made a hundred of these things in one year. And there's careful attention to the construction but also concealment of the seams. Um, the chimera is of course the mythical uh, lion-headed goat dragon from classical 
mythology. And I, and I use it as a kind of symbol that refers to the world that we live in today, where everything is already made, subject to you know, mashup, copying, pasting, sampling, remixing, the idea that we live in a really post-binary, transgendered world where all categories in many ways are at least conceptually, at least conceptually uh, dissolved. So for me, the chimera kind of represents let's say, um, incongruousness and indescribability of all kinds. So I'll quickly um, let some of the images scroll in front of you. So these first two images were sort of the, the, the beta tests, but then as you can see, the project goes on. They, most of them literally become three-bodied monsters. So um, samples of different works of architecture from at least three different sources, some of which you may not recognize. Some of you may have been to Columbus, Indiana, so all of the fragments in that piece are from Columbus. I love this projector. It, I mean, like, it's, <laughs> this is fantastic. I love the artists, too. So, um, If you're wondering how to get one, Western Exhibitions is open for business today. He's still got them there. Some of them kind of rotate so there's no top or bottom. And there again you see the, the collage from the, the ziggurat. So one of the interesting things that's happened then is that this, uh, this kind of project which started as a sort of, um, let's say, discursive or uh, speculative exercise, I, I've kind of realized that these are potentially, many of these are potentially, or some of these potentially, sketches for built works yet to come, right? Projects that haven't come my way yet. So there's another aspect of, of time the anticipatory or the eventual. So that's my way of swinging to actually the third uh, project. So as Lynn was saying, um, I'm, I do really believe that the future has yet to be invented. One of the things that people don't think about a lot, uh, not even most architects, I think, is that architecture is really an, what I call an anticipatory practice. What do I mean by that? The things that we design when we're working don't yet exist. In many ways, architecture is almost like fiction writing in the sense that um, the works, especially when they get very large, the works that we conceive exist off in a future, 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40, 50 years. So the works take a long time from conception to realization very often. So the challenge for me is really um, not to imagine a work of architecture that will produce, let's say, uh, certain social conditions, but actually to imagine the social, economic, political uh, conditions in which the work might exist. So right now I have a project in the United States Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale. And the title of the show this year is called The Architectural Imagination. The curators asked uh, 12 design practices from around the United States, of which mine was one, to um, basically design big buildings on four different sites in Detroit. So three architects on each site. So they asked for a big building, and they asked us to think about how Detroit be, could become a provocation or an inspiration for thinking about the architectural imagination itself. So our goal was not to really solve the problems of Detroit, of which uh, many of us are very familiar, but actually to, to um, let's say, uh, claim Detroit as a site for exploring the, the ongoing potentials of the architectural imagination to do many different things. So the project I propose is called the De Quinder Civic Academy. I only just realized that, so, so okay, let me back up. So the Oprah video, which I didn't really talk about, there's some mention of the world's largest charter school. Um, I guess that idea was bouncing around in my head, so this project is like the world's largest charter school, but it's in uh, Detroit. 
So I'm not gonna explain the, the project too much because we're gonna have another video that, that talks about the project, but I'll try to talk about you know, some of the ideas around especially the, the, the images and the models and the, the drawings, et cetera. So it's a new facility actually for an existing uh, charter school. And the idea is a, to create a campus inside a single building. So the site is the De Quinder Cut, which some of you may have heard of. Basically, the Quinder Cut is an abandoned rail line that has been turned into a park. So it's very similar to the 606 here in Chicago or the High Line in New York, except instead of elevated, it's actually pushed down about 20 feet below the rest of the, the city. Our site actually bridges the De Quinder Cut from Eastern Market to the west. So, you know, this is our site. This is my project. So there's a very active area over here to the west, Eastern Market, which is a very old and still, you know, very functioning market in the middle of the city. And then to the east, you get, let's say, the, the very kind of stereotypical um, so-called abandoned and emerging prairie that we've all read about in the Sunday Style section of the New York Times. Our site bridges, and there's the De Quinder Cut kind of going between there's your you know, uh, requisite urban farm. And then here is the Detroit Edison Public School Academy, which was only founded a few years ago. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, it's one of the few things in this area which is actually growing and quite rapidly. So it originally inhabited uh, a tomato drying uh, factory, and it's already expanded, which was here, and they've already built another building for uh, pre-K, they're talking about athletic facilities, et cetera. So it was interesting to me because in general, um, similar to the, the project Holy City, I'm interested in the relationship between architecture, institutions, power, uh, urban environments, et cetera. So the project tries to create both a bridge and a threshold, right? A bridge from what I'm calling the urban side to the pastoral side, but also a kind of gateway which you would pass, pass through. Um, the collages and drawings that you see uh, are all made uh, by my hands. And so the project is really trying to be an extension of what we in our field would call the city within the city paradigm. So in this collage on the left, you see Le Corbusier's Unité d'Habitation, which is a housing block in Marseille, France that was built after World War II. He had the idea of creating basically a vertical city. So inside there, you not have not only housing, there's a hotel, there's a grocery store, office space, other facilities. Um, in the middle, kind of sandwiched in the middle, the bridges and the other concrete block is a project in Sao Paulo, Brazil, by a very interesting architect named Lina Bobardi. Um, she created this uh, really stunning uh, community center that's partly a reuse of an old industrial facility called the SESC Pompeia. And then, of course, on the right, our very own Marina City by Bertrand Goldberg. So, in this slide, you can see what I would call the alpha and the omega of the project. The collage on the left, which was sort of the first uh, moment of inspiration after visiting the site and coming up with this idea of making a campus for the school within a single building. Um, and then on the right, the model, which shows up in the Biennale. So it's, it, what I wanted to show is how the, the, the project, the, the so-called final project, both supersedes its sources, so it, it goes beyond the original inspiration, but actually carries the influences of these precedents um, at various scales in terms of the form, the materiality, uh, et cetera. These small collaged views, for me, they work as sketches, but also as provocations. They try to ground the project in particular architectural legacy, or architectural history, so that's another connection to time. Um, and then on the right, you can see how the drawings that I make try to struggle to reconcile the dream of the collage, or the provocation of the collage, with the current realities of the site and the program. Um, this project is, I think, really haunted by that 
that building by Le Corbusier that I mentioned earlier, the Unité d'Habitation. This is a this model on the right is actually a section, what we call a section cut through the primary school bridge over the De Quinder cut. So what you're seeing here are studies of um, what I call cloven columns, which go up to about 40 feet high, which serve as structure, but they also carry services up into the building, like plumbing, uh, uh, water, sewage, other kinds of things, but they're also inhabitable themselves. So it's about thresholds within thresholds within thresholds. You also have extraordinary thick walls in the project um, about four feet with structure and services embedded. And this project is actually situated in a constellation with um, a couple of other important uh, projects that are trying to do similar things in Detroit. So um, my project is at the north, the De Quinder Civic Academy. As you work your way south, you see Mies van der Rohe and Ludwig Hilbersheimer's Lafayette Park, which is a very well-known um, and still actually pretty successful uh, housing project in Detroit. And then below that, uh, at the very bottom in the white, John Portman's Renaissance Center, which is now called the GM Center. Why is this interesting? Because I think that, um, well, they were also trying to create cities within the city. But um, they also, I think there's a kind of different way that they're trying to create civic space. So Mies van der Rohe really treated civic space as a, an open field, right? So this idea of the tower, the buildings floating in a, in a park, in an open landscape. John Portman actually, in a really innovative way, tried to reimagine civic space as an interior space. So the, the towers actually sit on a very large, very enclosed podium, which inside you find you know, cafes, restaurants, shops, even a movie theater, other kinds of things. It's quite spectacular if you've never visited there. My project tries to take another step forward. The De Quinder Civic Academy tries to take another step forward by thinking about public space as a network. So the, the building, as it moves around the site, kind of embraces these outdoor patios in an interesting way by not uh, fully enclosing them, but always creating openings where they connect to one another and the infrastructure of the city, including the De Quinder cut itself which sort of spills out into the project. So um, I also, before showing another video and sort of moving towards the end, just mention that I am still very invested and I think it's important to say this kind of thing here at the Art Institute in the craft of architectural drawings and, and artifacts, uh, including drawings like these with, in pencil, um, collages, models, other kinds of things because I think, and this was really a, an answer to the creative challenge of the, of the Biennale this year, or at least our part of the Biennale, the architectural imagination is really generated from um, and embodied by the artifacts that we make as architects. So for me, the hand drawings operate closer to the speed of thought, or at least the speed of my thought, but they also offer a richer body of evidence for the architectural imagination at work. So um, before I show this video, I'd like to give my thanks again, first of all, to Dr. Ross and Dr. Hauser for supporting this program. Um, they've been great supporters of my work and great friends this year, so I really want to um, give them a round of applause. And then also to the Humanities Festival and Allison Cuddy for the invitation to come back and share um, some of the work from what's been a really uh, exciting year for me in my practice. Um, that being said, I will, before questions, I'll take us out with one more video. Detroit, May 21, 2026. The De Quinder Civic Academy, the DCA, conducted opening ceremonies this week. 
As part of the city's ongoing reconstruction, the new institution, which grew out of the former Detroit Edison Public School Academy, has dramatically expanded its mission and scale. By accepting responsibility for the physical, social, cultural, and intellectual development of the city's children, from birth to adulthood. After decades of depopulation, the City Council hopes to expand the ranks of socially prepared and intellectually equipped citizens by privatizing the school system. DCA was conceived as a citadel that will shelter its pupils from the shocks of Detroit's ongoing transformation, while also inspiring visions for a metropolitan future, a future that still remains uncertain. DCA is more than a school. The architect imagined it as the physical manifestation of America's motto, E. Pluribus, Oenum, out of many. One. The entire 2.7 million square foot facility is a coordinate unit, a single architectural entity able to synthesize many diverse programs and spaces. The idea of the coordinate unit was developed earlier by John Portman, architect of Detroit's Renaissance Center. In his 1976 book, The Architect as Developer, Portman describes it as a total environment in which practically all of a person's needs are met. A village where everything is within reach of the pedestrian. The architecture of DCA is also a total environment with enough space and all the facilities necessary for its inhabitants to thrive. The megastructure's main spine bridges the Dequinder Cut, just south of the school's former location, and forms a new gateway, connecting Detroit's Eastern Market with the outlying territory. DCA is a monumental concrete structure which has been tinted with green calcite aggregate. Four foot thick exterior walls, with large, deeply set windows, insulate the interior from the increasingly extreme summer heat and winter cold. The vertical, west wing, contains additional public programs, including cultural spaces, a community college, workshops, and apartments for faculty. The taller tower measures 865 feet, with a bronze clad volume, housing a worship center near the top, and an observatory on the roof. The lower wing across the cut, is set among the quiet pastures of East Detroit. It contains family apartments, dining halls, a clinic, the recreation center, and library. Both the east and west wings, embrace large outdoor patios, with strategically placed thresholds, that provide security, while also creating formal entries, to the complex. A third public patio, said 20 feet below street level, within the Dequinder Cut, can be accessed via new pedestrian paths and bicycle ramps. A pond, for summer swimming and winter skating, is the centerpiece of this space, where the school intersects, with the public infrastructure of the Cut. The Academy's primary school hovers nearby, bridging diagonally from the southeast to northwest corners of the building connecting the site's urban and pastoral sides. It is supported by a series of monumental, cloven, columns, split at their bases, allowing people to walk through, with a sense of ceremonial passage. The philosopher, Henri Lefebvre, once wrote that the industrial era, destroyed urban society, by replacing oeuvres, with products. In 21st century Detroit, the decline of real estate, has placed renewed attention on the use value of architecture as civic infrastructure and aesthetic experience. When DCA was first proposed in 2016, few believed that this kind of monumentally civic project could still be achieved in America. Nonetheless, taking its place alongside Portman's Renaissance Center and Mies van Droes Lafayette Park, DCA has established a new refuge for collectivity, in a landscape, of growing, isolation. With the DCA, the architect aspired, to create a utopian institution, that is, a fortunate, or blessed place, within Detroit. Knowing as he did, that architecture,
cannot solve society's problems, but that it can formalize utopian models that inspire civic life and eventually lead to greater and more beautiful urban worlds. So I guess in the end, I would have to say, or maybe not the end, but in this moment when um, I think maybe a few too many of us uh, are longing for a mythical past, I'm actually interested in making new myths for the future because as far as I'm concerned, the future has yet to be claimed and the future can belong to us. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Um, there's two of us roving around the hall with microphones. We'll try to get to everyone before the time is over. So first one here, back in the hall. Hi, my name is Liz Moyer. Uh, I'm a climate scientist at UChicago. So I wanted to ask a question and then make one, and also make one comment. And the question is, in Detroit, why build a high rise? I mean, Detroit has extra real estate, so why not build a low rise? I mean, we have ex empty space there. <laughs> And I thought we were going back to the Jane Jacobs model of sort of pedestrian access and, and low rise rather than high. And then the comment for, on the, there was one thing in that movie that said winners will get more severe, but all the models predict that winners get less severe. So slight correction. Sorry, what was the, sec what was the last part? I didn't quite catch it. Uh, the single most common feature of models is that, especially in continental interiors, the winters become less severe. Very strong effect, not more severe. Right. Uh, the second you said climate scientist, I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> so, let's see, high rise, low rise. So this is, without this getting too technical, um, so in addition to architecture, I, always I also practice urban design. So what we know in our field is that uh, individual buildings can do very little to actually impact uh, the scale of the issues we have to deal with in terms of climate. So I'm on the same page as you. I, I recognize that as a, as a issue that our field has something uh, to contribute to dealing with. Um, that being said, I'm not entirely convinced that building low rise in Detroit, low rise or high rise is really the issue. I mean, Detroit was mostly low rise and actually the, the model of let's say um, single family residential which dominated in that city is part of what led to its uh, fragility. So I don't, I don't know that it's good to sort of create a dichotomy between those things. I think any robust urban environment needs a, a mix of, uh, mix of um, kinds of densities and scales uh, Etc. Uh, that being said, this is a proposal for one project, not necessarily a model for the whole um, city. And hopefully you'll accept that as a reasonable alibi. The second part, can you remind me? Right. Okay, thank you for the correction. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. So there's a question about what you know what affects the project. The the project projects itself as being a somewhat self-contained thing, right? And so what effects might it have on the the city or the 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 landscape around it, let's say? because that word city is pretty loaded in this context as well. 
Um, yes, of course. So before I answer the question, I, I think it, it's really interesting. So uh, now that I've been going around lecturing about this project, um, it's been really interesting. Like uh, the, I get a lot of questions which um, are directed towards what I feel to be my, um, my character. <laughs> but that's good. That makes for an interesting discussion. Uh, so the project, so when I make these projects, it, it, it is about the uncertainty of the future, right? So I think there were remarks in the video about the, the future of Detroit remaining uncertain. I, as an architect, have no real mechanism for predicting what will happen in the future of any urban environment, Detroit, New York, Brooklyn, uh, Chicago, St. Louis, otherwise, but I can imagine certain scenarios. The idea of this project is to explore, um, explore, for better and for worse, the relationships between architecture, urbanism, corporate and institutional power, right? All things, you know, and the notion of um, education and citizenship and civic space, um, all things which for us, for me as an architect, exist in kind of one messy soup where I recognize that as a designer, I have some agency in my ability to put ideas out into the world, but very little control over what happens in the world, right? Architects expand uh, the possibilities. Developers, citizens, politicians, et cetera, actually determine the realities. So the project uses architectural means um, to actually confront or, or let's say cope with that, that position. It tries to use architectural means to, to shape a particular space within which certain things can happen, recognizing that whatever happens outside uh, is really beyond what I could control. The project is already big enough. So this notion of the citadel, right, which is not entirely closed, but still open and connected to whatever's happening on the outside is, is exactly, it's, the project is, is trying to cope with exactly the issue that you're bringing up. All right, thanks for your provocations. I'm Steve Wiesenthal with Studio Gang Architects. So. Curious if you're... Now I'm in trouble again. <laughs> no, 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 not, no, not at all. I will um, tell actually, Jeannie, I will call her if you give me a hard time, I swear. <laughs> this is actually a comment about your first video, and I'm just gonna hazard a guess that it was made prior to Tuesday. Yes. And <laughs> It was one, made in 2010, actually. Okay, great. Which is another architecture and time thing we can talk um, about. Yes. And it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, I find it curiously hopeful and humorous about um, some magical solution to all of our infrastructure and public investment uh, concerns. And so now that it's after Tuesday, I'm wondering if you have any kind of reflection <laughs> on that video and the uh, hope that it contains. Um, <laughs> I mean, yes, I'm eternally optimistic. You know, uh, as my friends can tell you, I woke up, um, on Wednesday morning in a slightly different mood than a lot of my other uh, uh, lefty liberal uh, friends because in the work that I do, this kind of, um, you know, our architecture is an instrument of power for better or for worse. Um, as you know very well as a fellow architect. So um, you have to confront in your day-to-day -day practice and all of your work um, some of the aspects of society um, that maybe many of us don't like to, are aware is, that many of us are aware are out there but maybe um, don't like to think about too much. In my work, actually, I've chosen, and this is what I've been talking about a lot this week, 
I prefer it when the monster is out in the light than when it's in the dark. And so the videos, the projects, try to bring that aspect out into the light to where we can deal with it for better or for worse. So bring up the issue of bene benevolence in the first video, for example. The idea that it gives and it takes. Power gives and takes. Um, when we sit in a museum, for example, we should be able to recognize that easily enough. Um, you know, the charter school, right? I propose a, a, like a, a place for Detroit's children, but then I get called out for like things like urban renewal or making high rises or, you know, and reasonably enough, we should have those debates. But it's, it's, it's this kind of conflict, right? that I'm interested in working with as, as an architect. So for me, what's going on right now in America is, is not new, it's, it's been happening. And um, I try to do work that looks at the world as it has existed, past, as it exists today, present, but always projects some possibility for making um, a better future. So this idea of the utopia, not utopia with a U, no place, but utopia with an E, the idea of the fortunate or blessed place. But it doesn't try to do that in a way which is um, hopefully uh, naive, but in a way which, um, again, uh, deploys many different kinds of imagination and creativity. So even, let's say, you know, when, when bad things happen, I think there's still a possibility for using those as a stepping stone. You know, it's like this cliche, never waste a good crisis, right? So as a stepping stone into another space. Right here in the middle. Um, thank you for this. And I want to, again, go back to the 2010 mm -hmm. Chicago project to build on the previous questions a bit. Um, of course, as, as you know well and are alluding to, that site, the Circle Interchange, is where Burnham imagined his massive yes. civic center that was the centripetal point of a, of a unified city. Instead, there's this massive void. You've filled the void. You've done the same thing in Detroit. You're filling the <laughs> void, allowing that you can't control the future of the whole city, though. Am I hearing an imagining of the, the postmodern city as containing voids which are filled with cities and cities, that, uh, within cities that are essentially disconnected, more Los Angeles than New York? Uh, yes and no, right? <laughs> yes and no. Um, these kinds of things exist in world in the world for better or for for worse, and I think that you know there are great examples and there are poor examples of these kinds of projects, megastructures, coordinate units, etc. Some of which I love, some of which you know are uh, let's say uh, despicable. Uh, that being said. Um, I think there's the possibility for these kinds of things and low rise, for example. There's the possibility for, um, you know, these kinds of things and new forms of landscape architecture. I've done work in many different kinds of sites, in many different densities, in many different scales. Um, I think the world is diverse. Um, America in particular, if I can be more s specific, uh, America is vast. Our city of Chicago is vast. So I think the challenge is for us to get beyond some of the hard categories between city and suburb, um, between the center and the periphery, north and south is the one we have here in Chicago, north, south, west, et cetera and understand, if we actually zoom out, we see that our urban environment is, is incredibly um, mixed up and that the categories, if we actually look at what's out there, don't hold 
as well as we would like. So I hear what you're saying um, about a mess, one kind of message one could take away from this project. Um, but if you look just outside the boundaries of the core proposals or the, the kind of spectacular big image like this, just outside the boundaries of this thing or even within it, you have big open spaces, right? And the, the landscape is still free and kind of moving under and, and through this thing. So um, that would be my response to your, to your comment. Yeah, um, I see wonderful uh, artistry coming out of architects, particularly, you know, more recently. It, there's phenomenal creativity, uh, and there's spaces that you can enter into as a human and just be impressed with, you know? Uh, and at the same time, I see so much of what actually gets built just in terms of just volume of square footage being, you know, a development in the suburbs or uh, a high rise that's kind of bland or a, a big box store or a strip mall. Just the vast majority of what gets built and what's going to be around for 50, 60 years is bland and lacking your touch. Uh, for me, touch. Well, <laughs> yours personally, sure. And, and those wait, wait a few minutes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for me, I keep on coming back to an economic question. Uh, you know, architecture is an expensive art to uh, purchase unless you're a well very wealthy individual. And I'm wondering if you have any perspective on how to get more thoughtful design for, the, for people uh, more widely built in our, in our world. Sure. Um, every architect I know would like the answer to that question um, because this is an issue that we spend a lot of time concerning ourselves with, how to get more, better architecture in the world. And the strange thing is, bad architecture costs pretty much the same as good or great architecture in many cases. Um, that being said, I mean, we have to get specific. Uh, one of the challenges we have here in the United States, for example, is that we just have a lot of land, right, per capita. And so when you have a little surplus of something, you tend to value it less and you tend to be less careful about what you do with it, right? Um, I also would put some pressure on my own profession in the sense that we have to just be more clever and more open in our interactions with you know, broader audiences like, like this. I mean, we have to go out there and actually, we, you have to get out of the studio and connect with people at all levels of society. Um, not to simply ask them what they want and give it to them, but to exchange ideas and start to tell stories about what might be possible. There is a history of this in this city, for example. After Daniel Burnham wrote The Plan of Chicago, which of course is a great inspiration to many people in the city, even if they haven't read it, most of whom have not. Um, after they published The Plan of Chicago, there was something called uh, the Wacker Manual to The Plan of Chicago. Did any of you grow up reading this book in school? It was basically a school book that was made for um, the children of Chicago. Uh, I think eighth graders. So in the early part of the 20th century, this book was ostensibly distributed to every school child. And so you, you would, you, you read this thing, this kind of short version of the plan of Chicago. And the mythology is that it instilled a certain spirit in um, many people in a city who wound up becoming council people, mayors, you know, benefactors, et cetera which uh, supposedly explains why Chicago is such a capital of great architecture. Um, because we are very fortunate in this city, even though if we do see a few too many things around here, uh, which we don't think are that great, try New York, for example, <laughs> right? We are winning that, that race for sure. So I think it really is about um, telling stories. Right. I spend a lot of my time now uh, creating and telling stories as an, as an architect um, because what I'm hoping is that after people hear these stories for better or for worse, whether or not they agree with everything that's happening in them, their imagination about what the future of their city 
might look like has been expanded, and then they demand better architecture, uh, better urbanism, better landscapes um, than they're getting, and then hopefully get them. I was going to ask was about the um, Star Wars uh, Lucas Museum. Do you think that Chicago was at a loss for not getting a, a, the uh, that museum built? You know. You um, trying to get me in trouble? Um, <laughs> and the second was at the finale. What did they? Did you get feedback on your design? And on a lighter note, the third question: What did Oprah think about her? Um, because I went to one of her shows. Uh -huh. She's always a fan of mine. So I'll go backwards from the first. I have not, I have not heard from Madam Winfrey yet, <laughs> but I'm sure she's somewhere watching with her third eye. Um, in terms of the Biennale, the show is still ongoing. Uh, it'll be in Venice actually until November 27th when it closes, and then it will travel to um, Detroit. Our entire show will be at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit. I believe it opens February 2nd. We can rent a bus or something and all go out. And I think, you know, you get one kind of feedback from the, from the Venice Biennale, which is really a big spectacle, but a lot of the press has been very interesting. It's brought up some of the kinds of issues that have been talked about today. Uh, basically, people, uh, most of the writing, and this is not to sound defensive, this is just an observation, uh, most of the writing about our show so far has uh, questioned the kind of uh, the audacity of the curators and the architects to actually um, propose such uh, exuberant constructions for a place which currently holds uh, so much baggage in our cultural imagination. So, a one, so no one talks about the work, right? The actual architecture. Uh, what they talk about is our relative, um, uh, let's say, uh, either lack of social responsibility or morality or things like this. That's all fine. That's what exhibitions are for, to argue about these kinds of, of, of things. I think it will be interesting when the show opens in Detroit and we're really on the ground there and we'll see what happens. I think it's also interesting to imagine like, well, what if we had done this show uh, in Brooklyn? Would anyone be arguing about these things? Or if we had done it in, you know, Los Angeles, would anyone be arguing about these, these issues? That being said, that's all speculative. Um, the first, and then the first part of your question was? Star Wars, right, the Lucas Museum. I was hoping that we could just forget it. Um, so full disclosure, I am a member of the, the Mayor's Cultural Advisory Council. That being said, I say what I want. Um, I think that that debate was not really about architecture in the end. That was um, a failure of political outreach. The parks in the city of Chicago, in particular the lakefront, um, have been sacred for some time now. Everybody knows this, it's not a secret. So the people involved, I think, um, simply did not do a good job of preparing everyone for what was coming, um, developing the right coalitions and kind of creating the space in which people could actually imagine that thing being there. The fact that people still call it the Star Wars Museum tells you a lot because it wasn't about Star Wars. It was the Lucas Museum of Narrative, uh, in, Art, arts, right? It was like cartoons and Norman Rockwell drawings and other kinds of things. But no one knows this. No one knows this. So I think that tells you what the whole the whole thing was was about. And this is all we've we've been through this before. So um, you know, I don't want to you know stand here and and speak ill of the design or make judgments about whether or not we should ever build anything in the parks. 
um, because we have already and we continue to actually, if you pay attention. Um, the I think there's just the the question of yeah that was that was that was an example of how architecture institutions power politics um, and culture again are always mixed up in this kind of wild soup. <laughs> and with that, we have to bring it to a close. Thank you very much.